Hello, everybody. It's Murphy, and here with uh, actually the first time ever, the first time we've ever interviewed the world famous rock star of market research, Kristen Luck. Hey, Kristen. Quite an intro. Thanks, Lenny. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I know you don't teach your own horns, so let me do it for you. So, Thank you. I appreciate that. Now, it's night where you are, so, uh, so it is. where are you, Miss Globetrotter? I'm in Athens, Greece right now. I'm, I'm here recovering from SMR Congress. <laughs> <laughs> so from, uh, from pub crawling or just in general? No, just in general. I mean, it was a, you know, it's, I think, you know, it's definitely one of the largest and most intense research conferences of the year. So um, between, between SMR board meetings and then, you know, a full three days of Congress, it's a, it's a pretty grueling schedule. <laughs> I, I can understand. So on that note then, what was uh, what were the big topics that came out of this one? What's that for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was interesting. There was, a, you know, there was a lot of focus on sort of what the future of the industry looks like. You know, um, I, as part of um, as part of our board meetings, one of the things that we talked about, in which we also presented at Congress, you know, as an advisory board, was this 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 real notion of hey as researchers, we kind of need to start expanding what our definition of research is and that we need to participate really in the broader marketing intelligence community. And, um, and Simon Chadwick kind of, he kicked off Congress with some slides that I thought were really illuminating, which kind of looked at, hey, where are the big private equity investments going into market research? And I think some of this has also been um, been illuminated or discussed in some of the reports that you've released, Lenny, but, you know, we kind of look at, hey, where is our business really growing? And it is in these areas of big data and secondary research. And so I think that that was, that was a, you know, a big subject of conversation at Congress. Um, you know, wh where is the future of the industry and, and where are we going to be monetizing some of the, some of these kind of alternative data streams and how do we incorporate that into research? So, Thematically, you know, I think that that was a big topic. But then also this this notion of um, an engagement, which we've been talking about so long as an industry. I'm surprised that it's still <laughs> still such a hot topic. But but definitely this consumer engagement um, issue that I think we continue to have as researchers has has been has been and continues to be a big topic of discussion at all the conferences. So I heard that, uh, that SSI uh, has been rolling out their, uh, well, just a few weeks before that, MRMW, they did their panel of consumers who said, ah, you know, everybody sucks. Uh, <laughs> but they released Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I take 100 surveys a day for a buck each. Yay. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but also that SSI had released some data at Congress uh, in a new presentation on uh, they were actually getting worse in some metrics uh, from an engagement standpoint. What was that about? Yeah, you know, I have to tell you that I think that probably got me more worked up than any other presentation at Congress. Well, it was a it was a graph that actually showed that since 2000, it was either 2010 or 2011, that our average survey length has not gotten shorter, it's actually gotten longer. Wow. Um, and as you can imagine, as somebody that has gone out and talked a lot about shortening surveys and how do we redesign research and how do we make surveys easier to take, um, to hear that all of those efforts have been sort of in vain wow. <laughs> and that surveys are actually getting longer, you know, was, was really distressing. <laughs> Although, you know, I wonder, uh, that being said, that was off of SSI's, uh, their own data, right? Off of surveys. Well, it's off of their data, but it's across their panel. So it's not just surveys that SSI has fielded. It's this, right. it's also across surveys that their clients have fielded. Right. And, my, and, you know, there was a lot of discussion about this at Congress, Lenny, because I was, you know, I was talking to a bunch of people about it, and some people were like, hey, well, some of those people that are programming surveys, they don't know what they're doing or they're not real researchers. Like, there's a, a thousand different excuses that I heard for why that could be the case. Right. But well, I would like to think that with the advent of some of the, you know, other sample sources uh, or, or companies that are using programmatic or, you know, mobile only, maybe those numbers are a little bit different in those situations. I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, I would hope so, but I do, you know, I do think that there are, there is a real continued focus on solutions for for improving consumer engagement, and and I think that, gosh, you know, got in the worst case scenario, even if 
surveys are running longer, I do feel like there has still been a lot of focus on things that you can do to improve engagement, right. even in situations where you're asking a lot of people. And by a lot, I mean like anything over 15 minutes, to me feels incredibly taxing and like we're really asking people for, for maybe more than we should be. Absolutely. Well, you know, actually, we're in the middle of fielding grit right now. And for the yeah. first time ever, uh, we are really struggling with completes. Um, the, uh, and my thought was, well, you know what? It, we, we, we were hypocritical. So it's a 15 minute long survey. <laughs> you know, uh -oh. Not an incentive. Uh, and uh, no matter what our efforts to make it look cool or increase the, the experience, um, it still is a damn 15 minute long survey people don't have time for and we're not rewarding them effectively and giving them a, a real value exchange for it. So we're paying the price, even within our own population, within our own industry. So why should we be surprised the consumers are saying, no, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, I think that's an important piece of it is that if you are going to run a longer survey, you know, there are things that you can do to make that, that survey taking experience more pleasant. I mean, one, you know, one, and this is something you mentioned, is certainly to make the survey mobile optimized and make it so that you are able to come back and forth into the survey so you can take it in pieces if you need to. You know, um, Annie Pettit wrote a great article maybe a year or two ago on humanizing surveys and about asking people questions like they're normal people instead of asking them like we're robots, which, you know, I mean, a lot of the language in surveys is not very natural and not, you know, it's not very engaging for people. Right. Um, and then certainly, you know, what you just alluded to, which is, you know, people have to feel like their time is valued. Um, and I know as, a, as an industry, we are super resistant to properly incentivizing people, but I think that it goes a long way. And I don't feel like you have to give people a, a, something tremendous in order to make them feel valued. I mean, most of, the, most of the panel discussions that I've seen where, you know, I've sat on a couple panels where we had actual respondents. I mean, they were very enthusiastic about participating in research if they felt like their time was was valued and that there was something meaningful that was coming from their participation. And I, and I do think, you know, between utilizing incentives and some of the tactics that, you know, Annie, Annie talked about in her paper, which I think was published on, on Quirks, um, you know, I think that there are small things that we can do to, to improve that situation with our respondents. So, you know, I'm on the uh, board with virtual incentives, their advisory board. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, certainly this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, because it's near and dear to their heart. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it is an, it's an important issue. Um, uh, so kind of thinking about that idea of, of how companies from outside the research space, but are stakeholders in the research process that are trying to help our industry uh, to innovate in terms of how we engage, whether it's a company like Virtual Incentives, doing incentive solutions or loyalty programs, uh, mm -hmm. companies like AMIA, um, whatever the case may be, uh, protege, swag box, you know, all these different, yeah, yeah. Uh, what can we learn from them? What do we need to be listening to, to, uh, to gain inspiration and kind of change our own modus, uh, modus operandi from, from these companies who are experts in how to reward and engage consumers? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think one big thing, and, and this is a trend that I'm seeing kind of in the incentive space that I think is really valuable, is this whole idea of instantly incentivizing somebody. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people are used to like, oh, I'm going to take a survey and I'm going to enter it into a sweepstakes at some indeterminate point where I might win $100 if Jesus descends from the heavens. <laughs> you know, like, it's like your chance is so low of winning something that it's like, does it, is it ever really going to happen? Um, you know, and I think having having access to lots of different ways to incentivize people is also, you know, to have that flexibility and people to be able to pick. You know, I know, um, um, oh gosh, I can't remember. Sean Case is going to kill me because I can't remember the name of his sample company research, right now. Research for good. Yes, research for good. Sorry, Sean, I just saw you in Dublin, and I now I'm just blowing it. I got it. Um, but, you know, like to be able to incentivize people through donating to a charity, which I know a lot of the in incentive companies, I think virtual incentives being one of them, can, can also do, offer charitable incentives. So I think having, having not only that flexibility in terms of how we reward, but also the ability to incentivize on the spot. I mean, I can't even tell you over the course of my career how much time research companies spend just corresponding with respondents about, 
hey, I didn't get my check, or I didn't get my incentive, or I completed this survey four weeks ago and I still haven't gotten my Amazon gift card. I mean, there's so many good solutions out there now that there's really no reason why respondents can't be incentivized as soon as they complete that survey. Absolutely. That's why I'm I mean, just thinking of the mobile paradigm. Even, even in and of itself, you're taking the survey on a mobile device, which we know that's increasing and is only going to continue to increase, then we should automatically get that solution right there on your mobile device. Yes. Oh, I did it. I'm going to go spend it at Starbucks right now. I'm going to yeah. spend it. You know, the, the whole surge of mobile payments. I mean, all of those things kind of leads to that instant gratification culture that I think we've, we've developed, uh, especially in the era of social media, right? If it's yeah. not fun, if it's not rewarding, it's not engaging, I'm not going to do it. I think we're being yeah. trained that way. And certainly the, the emerging, the, the millennials, Generation Z, I think absolutely kind of have that mentality of, no, it, it's about me. This isn't about you. Don't worry, the old timers have it too. Because right. I do too. I literally exclusively buy Starbucks stuff stuff off of my Starbucks app on my phone. My credit cards are in my phone, so I can pretty much go anywhere with Apple Pay and buy things. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think what you said is is really, really relevant, which is, hey, if I can incent people right on a mobile device, like you know, like why why wouldn't you do that? I mean, it, it's it it is to me, it's a real no-brainer. And I feel like as researchers, we don't really have an excuse anymore for poor delivery of of incentives or or poor you know poor responding engagement, frankly. Right. You know, years ago, I, I started thinking about this. Uh, you know, when I was trying to develop Brands Camp 360, and what occurred to me is I needed to think like a marketer, but yeah. act like a researcher. Um, mm -hmm. And that uh, I think that's still a truism that as an industry, we have to think more like marketers, which is probably sounds like blasphemy to uh, a lot of folks that are listening. But I don't see any other way for us to be successful uh, in this emerging competitive marketplace. The type of things that Simon you know, talked about, they don't have a problem going in that direction. In fact, when you look at programmatic and big data, you know, those are utilizing marketing data sets, marketing data channels. Effective yeah. To, uh, to generate the data that is for insights. So how do we compete? Yeah. Well, and I know this is both something that both you and I spend a lot of time consulting on is the actual marketing of market research. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, we're market researchers, but we're literally the worst at marketing ourselves and our own businesses. And frankly, like we're not doing a great job of marketing surveys to respondents. No. You know, we don't treat them well. We don't incentivize them correctly. You know, we don't, you know, and then we expect them to clamor to come back and, and give us data again. Right. So. Right. And we wonder why, you know, increasingly there's evidence that the, uh, the population of folks that are engaged in panels are primarily just there playing um, to uh, professional respondents. So. Right. Yeah. Um, so anything else that came out of SMR that was just kind of mind blowing? Uh, that you thought, oh, this is important. This will be a, a defining topic for 2016. Yeah, I mean, you know, there were so many good presentations, and frankly, you know, I think one of the one of the things I really love about SMR Congress and 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 also about you know IEX in Europe is that you do truly get a more global perspective about what's going on in the industry. I mean, I think that you know, particularly in the U.S., we tend to be very insular. We go to all of our own research conferences and think we're doing amazing things in the U.S. And then you go to a truly global conference and you think. Wow, there's so much there's so much more going on. I mean, there's really interesting research being done in Africa and um, in in Asia Pacific. And so, you know, for me, it was it was just about getting out and trying to see what was going on in different different regions of the world. But I do think, again, you know, that emphasis on kind of ancillary forms of data and how do we incorporate new technologies and new data sources into our more traditional methods is is something that really continues to resonate with me. And I think, you know, when we look at where funding is flowing into the industry, that's speaking volumes too about, about how those trends are really going to shape our industry moving forward. So. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of events, uh, what else is on your calendar for the rest of the year? Um, yeah. Where else so you I'm in, at CASRO in a couple weeks. I'm actually going to be um, on a debate about the future of market research. So I believe I'm debating John Gilfeather on whether or not the term marketing research is really broad enough to define us as an industry. So we'll be debating against that. <laughs> Interesting, fun. Yep, yep. yep. Um, and uh, and then I'll also be at TMRE. I'm um, I'm uh, uh, moderating a, a client panel on the main stage on one of the days, and I'll also be there with um, Tom Anderson, who's seen the NGMR awards. So 
we're, uh, we'll be we'll be presenting those words again together this year. So okay. I'll be there. And then yeah. next year in March, you'll be in Amsterdam. And I, I will be. Know. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, there's no escape. So there's no escape. I would never want to escape that conference. It's amazing. If you, hey everyone, if you haven't been there, <laughs> IEX Amsterdam. It's my, you know, one of my favorite shows of the year. All right. So yeah. I need to get my phone and send you a instant reward for the plug. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> no, thank you for that. Um, it looks like it's getting late there in, in Greece. I don't want to keep you anymore. Um, thank you so much, Kristen. It's always, always a pleasure. Uh, it's great to catch up, and hopefully, I'll see you at one of those conferences, or we'll chat again soon. Yes, thanks, Lenny. All right, thanks.